Yeah, thanks for joining the uh, Unlock the Zone webinar. Um, I'm Charlie here with Mike. Um, and today we're going to kind of dive into uh, Onyx Backcountry and uh, as a tool and how it can uh, help unlock some adventures for you. And Mike's going to share some local knowledge about Rocky Mountain National Park and um, backcountry skiing there and um, all that it has to offer. Um, so I'm Charlie Von Avis. I'm a uh, senior product manager at Onyx Backcountry. I uh, live and play in Bozeman, Montana, a uh, big skier, um, trail runner, mountain biker, you name it. Um, and have been working hard to um, on Onyx Backcountry to make, make the product as good for skiers as possible. And joined today by uh, Mike Susi, uh, IFM, IFMGA guide uh, and AMGA guide, please. Um, author and uh, from the Colorado Mountain School. So Mike, if you want, um, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, so today we'll uh, talk a little bit about Onyx, Onyx's history and um, as a mapping platform and um, kind of how we approach um, making tools for backcountry skiers. And, um, <clears throat> but then we'll dive into the good stuff with Mike around um, creating and organizing a tour plan at Rocky Mountain National Park, checking the conditions, uh, and then taking that plan into the field with us. Uh, if you're joining us tonight, um, we're currently doing a 40% off sale on Onyx Backcountry. So if you scan that QR code, um, that'll take you to 40% off both premium, our, our premium and elite membership tiers. So I'll hold. It looks like the link up post in the chat too. So we will move on and you can check the chat. Um, and Mike here is a, as I mentioned, is a, is a licensed guide. So Mike, tell us a little bit about, um, about your guiding services. Uh, sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is Mike Susi. I live in Longmont, Colorado. And uh, I have been fortunate enough to call Rocky Mountain National Park my home range, home zone for alpine climbing and ski mountaineering for 20 years or so and um i work as a year-round professional mountain guide uh up in the park and and elsewhere and um i love ski ski mountaineering ski touring nordic skiing i was really just enjoying uh the glory of uh seeing our our first american individual title in nordic skiing happen to uh, happen today um, and, um, yeah, everything about Rocky Mountain National Park is, uh, is, uh, connected to what I like to do in the mountains. So lots of adventure and, uh, and it's a great place to learn, you know, so it's close to home for a lot of people that, uh, that live here in the front range. And, uh, I work with people from like total beginners who have never ski toured before, um, all the way up to, you know, people who have, a uh, you know, um, specific objective on their list like skiing off the top of Long's Peak or you know visiting it using the park to prep for you know a, a far-flung range of uh, ski mountaineering and elsewhere in the world so um, love to do it and love to help people uh, to learn and have fun in the mountains. Yeah so if you see anything um, in this webinar today that looks awesome and is inspiring to you um, but you're not sure um, or you want some guidance out there in the mountains, reach out to Mike. Um, awesome. So uh, Onyx uh, has been around since 2009. Um, we have been a mapping platform for uh, outdoor adventures um, for the over a decade. Um, we started in the hunting space with Onyx Hunt, um, which was mapping private and public lands and terrain for, for hunters that um, uh, need to know where they stand in the backcountry. Uh, in 2019, we launched Onyx Off-Road, which is um, sort of a, a four by four um, off-roading focused uh, trail map um, and uh, built off the same platform. And in 2021, uh, we launched Onyx Backcountry, which we'll talk about today, um, which is our product catered more towards uh, the human powered adventure, um, skiers, uh, backpacking, uh, trail running, you name it. Um, but yeah, we're a mapping platform that is serving uh, the outdoor community with accurate and uh, powerful maps. So what is Onyx Backcountry? Um, at a glance, um, we are a uh, 
uh, trail map. We are uh, an offline map. We have uh, ski guidebooks. Um, it's kind of like an all-in-one planning tool um, for outdoor adventures. Um, we try to bring in all of the data that you need to plan, whether it's in summer or in, uh, in winter time, uh, all into one tool. Uh, and so what makes us different is, you know, like I said, we've been around since for over a decade. Um, we've built a very reliable platform that you can trust in the backcountry. Um, you know, we work very hard to make it usable. Um, we highly curate content, which Mike is the author of some of that. So we'll uh, talk a little bit about that today. Um, uh, we care a lot about your data and, and privacy around it. Um, and, and we don't share user data. Um, and we're purpose driven. We work, we have a commitment to supporting avalanche forecasting, awareness and research. Um, and in the summertime, uh, we work with organizations like Leave No Trace uh, because we believe in making um, the outdoor community better. And with that, we'll jump into Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, so just to give you a quick orientation, this is uh, Onyx Backcountry's um, uh, desktop uh, browser app. Um, we also are a, a mobile phone app, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, but it's a, it's a mapping interface where you can choose your mode, whether you're um, hiking trails or uh, exploring in the snow. Each mode has a set of layers to, uh, um, to help uh, you know, create overlays that uh, give you more details about the terrain or avalanche conditions. Um, you can create waypoints and draw routes, um, switch between topo and satellite imagery, um, and also download offline maps, um, which again will save to your phone um, when you go out in the field. Um, so now that we're oriented, um, cool, we're looking at the Rocky Mountain National Park, but um, Mike, let's say you know we we live in Longmont or Denver, and we're interested in going into the park. Like, um, uh, where should we start looking? Like, what's the what's your entry point into starting to explore Rocky Mountain National Park? Like, um, uh, what what conditions are we looking for, and um, kind of where would you start exploring? Yeah, good question. Um, so it's fairly straightforward to figure out logistics of of skiing in the park. Um, and the main reason for that is if you're on the east side on the front range, um, you're limited to really just uh, fewer than a handful of, of uh, trailheads to start from. So, you know, a lot of people start skiing from uh, the hidden valley, the old hidden valley ski area and hidden valley, what's called the hidden valley snow play area now. Uh, and that's a great spot if you're a, you know, um, more interested in just flatter ski touring or um, you're, you know, trying to stay out of avalanche terrain for the day. Um, that's a great place to start. And um, the Bear Lake Trailhead is probably stop number two if you're interested in getting up into near and above tree line and, um, you know, more uh, challenging terrain. Um, and then finally, you know, you keep moving your way south through the park and you've got trailheads like Glacier Gorge, um, Wild Basin and Long's Peak, you know, so essentially you're just looking at the, the highest uh, plowed spots through the, uh, through the winter time. Um, and cool. uh, yeah. And yeah. Those zones that you're mentioning here, I'll, I'll call out. So these, uh, you know, mapped here, we've got like the Long's and Meeker South and, um, uh, you know, your, that Long's Peak zone that you mentioned. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with Onyx, like the, the guidebook that Mike helped write um, with Beacon, um, with Beacon guidebooks uh, is basically all, he, all that content is here, right? So in Long's Peak, you can get a description of, of what that zone is, um, you know, sort of what the, uh, the terrain details of it are. And then we also can connect that to, okay, what are the nearby snow conditions or avalanche forecast in those zones? And then you can also drill into the uh, individual descents. Um, so within the product, we'll have that, but Mike's gonna give us more color commentary than just what's in the, uh, what's in the product for today. So cool, those are the, so you're looking for like plowed road access and um, some of those zones you mentioned. Um, how would you go about like, 
tell us like where do you start in terms of looking at conditions, understanding like where the best place to ski is for the for the particular day. Yeah, you know, so much about skiing in Rocky is dependent upon the uh, um, the weather. You know, uh, you you quickly find yourself um, exposed to near and above tree line, higher altitude weather conditions. So um, it's you know not necessarily a spot where it's easy to um, to be able to just um, hide in the trees, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's that's both kind of a blessing and a curse, right? So uh, you know places like Hidden Valley and the lower elevations of Bear Lake offer uh, offer great options for um, below tree line skiing. Uh, whereas you know if you do look at the weather forecast and find you know winds blowing. 40 miles an hour or whatever it might be um, at the near tree line elevation um, you know your your options are kind of limited you know quite mm -hmm. honestly so um, you, it's it's a bit harder to hide in the trees there so I'm that's the first thing that I'm often looking for is what's the what's the weather and the wind doing up high uh, can I can I see where I'm going and am I going to be able to uh, you know to safely travel and communicate with my partners and you know how's that wind going to affect the the snowpack stability up there. Yeah, great. And here looking at like the point forecast um, within Onyx, we can see, you know, 19 miles an hour out of the west. Um, but what other, what other um, ways do you, do you check wind or kind of understand what, what's going on in the, in the field there? So on the Colorado Avalanche Information Center is a great sort of one-stop shop for uh, <clears throat> both avalanche conditions as well as recent snowfall. Um, I like to look at, um, you know, once I, once I get into here to this page, um, I can get a great overview about what's going on in the, in the Rocky Mountain National Park zone. I love this new point forecasting um, approach that the CAIC is using now to their, uh, to their zones. Uh, if I want to dive in a little bit deeper, I can go to uh, the CAIC weather stations. And the one that I like to use is the Bear Lake weather station. So that's under the observations tab. Um, yep. And you can just go down to view weather stations there and it brings up that next tab that Charlie's already got up. But yeah, keep scrolling. Um, and I'll show you how to find that. And it's under the front range zone and they're uh, stopped there and they're, um, they're organized via elevation. So go down to 9,500 feet in elevation there. And that's where you'll find Bear Lake. Yep. And um, click on that and uh, that next tab will come up. And this tells you uh, about recent um, temperatures and, uh, and change of snow height. So on the, the right next to last right column down there in the text, you can measure uh, recent snow height changes. So you know how much it snowed and uh, by the hour and, um, and what the current temperature is. So you know, one challenge of uh, recreating above tree line in Rocky is that it's uh, it's difficult to um, to be able to get access to real time wind information because we don't have an above tree line weather station. Bear Lake, the Bear Lake site here um, that we're looking at is uh, is really well sheltered just outside of the parking lot, so it doesn't give us representative wind information. So uh, I've really been digging about. The Onyx site is this um, point forecast weather or waypoint weather information that uh, that they offer. So, you know, if you go someplace like the top of the Banana Bowl run, for instance, uh, and click there uh, and add a waypoint, then you can get their uh, their waypoint weather information there. And um, that gives you sort of a, uh, uh, an estimate that I found to be fairly accurate, you know, that uh, that combines um, the nearest uh, um, weather uh, weather stations in the region to be able to tell us what's going on up there. So yeah, and and it's cool you mentioned this because this because um, like Mike said that it's not a measured wind value. Um, and I think you might have just on I drop away point and and uh, turned on this wind direction um, tool here, um, but it's using. Um, uh, it's using weather models to sort of estimate what the winds are at that point. And it's cool that you're, you've been hearing that that's, that is accurate for you. Um, and another couple tricks in the, in the product to kind of highlight what Mike's saying is the Bear Lake weather station, which we are looking at here, um, is this, is this 
uh, Snowflake, right? So you can also tap that and get a quick readout, um, or you can dive deeper into the raw, the raw data um, out here. Um, and also in the bottom right here, you can drag and drop this little uh, crosshairs to get your your point forecast. So you'll see that 19 degrees, or sorry, 19 mile an hour wind uh, coming out of the west is coming from that from that point forecast. So. So yeah, kind of a myriad of weather tools along with the stuff that uh, CAIC um, produces, which is also awesome. Um, cool. The, uh, I'll, I'll jump in for one more. Yeah. Um, the last tool that I really like to use is just getting my eyes on it. And um, you know, if you've lived in the Front Range or, or for instance, if you're here today looking up at the mountains, it's pretty easy to walk to the end of your street and look to the West and know that um, you know, the weather's doing something up in the mountains. And so um, I do like looking at the webcams uh, for Rocky Mountain National Park that, you know, are on the, uh, the NPS, the Park Service site. And uh, if you just scroll down through those a bit, um, let's see, well, that one looks like it's pretty well covered over. Uh, the Kawanichi Valley is, uh, is the west side of the park over near Grand Lake. So that's what we're looking at there. This, the Continental Divide is, um, somewhere down around um, just below the Glacier Gorge trailhead. So where we would be looking up at like Hallett Peak and into Glacier Gorge here. And then it looks like the Long Speak one is just straight up uh, um, dysfunctional right now, which fortunately mm -hmm. is pretty rare, but usually you get a nice view up into the east face of Long's, uh, Long's Peak. So that gives you at least some eyes on information about what's happening up, uh, up high in the mountains if you live, you know, um, 30 or 40 miles away. Yeah. Well, we love to see this active. Yeah, snow that. <laughs> nice. Um, great. Well, flipping back to um, our avalanche forecast, oops, which was here. Um, you know, it looks like today we're, we're seeing a considerable danger with some of that new snow that's coming in. Um, yeah, like what, how would you guide somebody to uh, interpret that and turn that into like a, a tour plan for the day? Yeah, I mean, that's a, you know, that's a big question. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if you're, if you log on to the CAIC website and you look at, you know, the language that you're using, they're using there and, and the advice that they're using there and it's unfamiliar to you, then, um, you know, you should be making conservative decisions in traveling in terrain that, uh, you know, you know is, is well away from avalanche terrain. Um, we're in an interesting period here, you know, in, on the front range Colorado where our snowpack is, is you know, becoming deep enough that, uh, you know, we are seeing moderate avalanche danger in, in a lot of the places and in, in much of the time here in the last couple of weeks. But uh, the avalanche problem that is driving the the rising avalanche danger in in the uh, uh, the short term here is this is this wind slab is that we've got a whole bunch of new snow falling up high and winds coming from the west mm -hmm. uh, loading loading east facing slopes so uh, so and what kind of um, you know thinking back to you know then this this zone like what kind of terrain features would you be looking for slow and um, and yeah how how would you kind of approach finding a spot. Uh, a terrain well, that matches that that forecast. Yeah, um, going back to the CAIC um, page here that you were just on, I think I'd, I'd probably just play the elevation game um, today, knowing that you know up at the higher elevations, the wind is is driving uh, you know the transportation of snow into slabs, and you can mm -hmm. see that below tree line, um, you've got lower avalanche danger, and it's where the wind slab problem is uh, is not quite as much of an issue. So if I were looking for good snow today, I would just follow the advice of the CAIC and, you know, be hunting for uh, uh, less wind affected uh, powder skiing below tree line. Awesome. Um, does Bear Lake have any, uh, does that, do they offer any of that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, if you zoom in um, and look at the, uh, the terrain from, from essentially what we're looking at is Mario Gully, um, all the way up to Dream Lake, uh, you know, all that stuff there um, is really below 10 and a half thousand feet, you know, which is what we often consider the, you know, transitional elevation from uh, below to, to above tree line here in Colorado. So mm -hmm. 
Yeah, plenty of uh, plenty of protected stuff. You know, the um, switching from the topo to the satellite view here can also give you a lot of information about you know how well covered that terrain is. You know, you can see here that um, you've got below tree line with some some fun openings and that kind of thing. Uh, whereas if you work a lot to the west, things really start to open up. Uh, the the added bonus of you know having higher winds up above tree line in Rocky is that. You know, we often see a lot of that snow getting blown down into these lower elevations, mid and lower elevations, you know, below 11,000 feet. So there's uh, often a deeper snowpack and, and maybe some nice potter skiing hiding out in the trees down there. Awesome. Um, yeah, it looks like, so what we've got here, um, you know, these, these lines on the map, the dotted ones are, are approaches. So, you know, from your trailhead, um, the Tyndall Gorge approach will um, take you all the way up into Tyndall Gorge. Um, uh, and likewise, this is kind of your exit if you came over to Mario Gully or maybe popped up this way to Dream Shoots. Um, so the dotted lines are kind of your, your transportation in and out of these zones, while the, the solid ones are, your, are the, uh, the ski lines that, again, come from uh, that beacon guidebook um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'm glad you, you know, it's cool to see like when we flip to, to satellite that you can clearly see that, you know, you're below tree line um, and it's probably more protected area. And if you flip into 3D too, you can get a much better sense of what the train's doing there. Um, and also puts into perspective with the above tree line train that's protecting it, um, you know, as you said, to the west. Um, how about, talk about like a little bit about slope angles and um uh aspect and kind of how you would be how you'd be looking um at optimizing that given uh you know a, a day like we're seeing today yeah so you know for folks that are familiar with with skiing along the front range um you know it, i i don't really even need to mention that um there's there's not a whole lot of skiing on the west side of the compass um oftentimes especially until the spring you know but for for those folks that are that are new to the zone, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's important to remember that like once you get up higher and above tree line and even some of the mid elevation stuff, everything it's, you know, it's dry enough and exposed enough to the wind here that things that face in the windward direction don't really hold snow. Um, so you're not gonna find, um, certainly not very much avalanche danger, but um, not even a whole lot of skiable terrain, you know, really on the west side of the compass um, here on, uh, on that side of the divide. So, um, we're, you know, fairly limited in, in our choice of terrain to stuff that faces north through east through south um, most of the time. And uh, that just so happens that's where the wind puts a lot of the snow, you know. So in terms of um, finding aspects, you know, uh, it's often um, following where, you know, the prevailing winds are. If, if it's northwest, you know, a lot of the things coming from the northwest, a lot of the things that might face north might might have a bit more scouring to them. If it's coming from the Southwest, then, um, you know, the, the things that face North might be a bit more loaded. Uh, as we get further along in the season into the later winter and springtime, you know, the sun plays a lot more important a role and it's just starting to do so right about now. And, um, you know, we have to think about what's gonna be getting the most um, sun exposure, so. I think that's where this layer is really useful. You can see what's going to be getting early morning sun there that's highlighted in, in yellow. And um, some of that stuff, you might be finding crusts underneath um, even, even right now, and certainly more so as we get into the month of March. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and for, for slope angles, um, are you... Yeah, like how would you kind of evaluate this terrain? Um, you know, it looks like we've got some steep gullies and, and bits here. Um, yeah, talk us through a little bit of how you navigate that or um, what you'd be looking for. Yeah, so, you know, a day like today with considerable avalanche danger, slope angle is, is really like your ace in the hole. Um, you know, aspect, as I, as I stated a second ago, is your choices are fairly limited. If you want to ski good snow, um, then you have to stay on the east side of the compass and preferably, you know, north through east. Um, 
on on most days and uh so so slope angle is going to be your your number one tool to be able to minimize your exposure to avalanche danger so um being able to you know to stick to um slopes that are 30 degrees and under you know which have that like kind of um uh light uh, orange into yellow light orange into yellow shading you know that's um that's your uh that's your wheelhouse right there yeah and um you know the park is really steep terrain um there's a lot of a lot of rock cliffs and gullies and things like that so learning how to um to get through the micro terrain you know so for instance we're looking straight up into the terrain park right now in the middle of the screen you see a whole lot of like purple and blue uh and you know that I think if you're new to the area, that might deter you from uh, from getting into that terrain on a on an elevated hazard day. But mm -hmm. um, you know, you you actually get eyes on it, and you notice that there's um, you know an actual way through some of that steep, cliffy, rocky terrain that's a little bit lower angled. Um, so I think um, you know getting up into that terrain and and getting your eyes on it and starting with a conservative mindset and um, using these map features to just help you ease into it and gain some familiarity would probably be the um, approach that I'd take on a day like today. Great. Well, let's fast forward a little bit too, because as you mentioned, like springtime, springtime is nearly upon us. Tomorrow is March, actually, which is often when ski, ski mountaineers start to get giddy. And as you mentioned, uh, um, Rocky Mountain has a ton of big terrain, and you can see here in the in the guidebook, right? There's tons of lines like that are really big. But um, let's say you know we're stepping out of powder skiing into into trying to get up the Alpine and taking off objectives. Um, yeah, where where should we start looking looking there? And um, and then let's kind of walk through uh, the, those considerations. Yeah, so you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of terrain to to unpack here in Rocky, from you know Hidden Valley all the way down to to Long's Peak. So um, I think I'll I'll focus on that Tyndall Gorge zone that that we've been looking at, uh, and um, you know, I think my mindset when when things start to open up in the higher elevations, and I have both you know a, a snowpack, um, a, you know. Uh, avalanche danger level, weather forecast, and, you know, a partner in a day that I'm psyched to, to step out and get up higher. Um, I want to make sure that, you know, I'm stepping into that terrain and, and um, reinforcing that confidence that, you know, both the weather forecast and the, the avalanche uh, center are giving me before, you know, I really commit myself to anything. So, you know, say the Tyndall Glacier run um, that we see in the back of the Tyndall Gorge there is a, is a great one to step out into because you actually get to see um, the entirety of the Tyndall Gorge while you skin all the way up to the Continental Divide. Uh, the terrain gets steeper as you go higher, you know, so you're not, um, you know, committing to yourself to anything too, uh, committing yourself to anything too early on in the day. And you get your eyes on a whole lot of terrain in both aspects. So um, I'd probably start with something like that. And then, you know, uh, as you gain confidence in, in the snowpack and, you know, you get that good weather forecast you want, then maybe you you know, step out further into a steeper ski mountaineering line, say like the Dragon Tail Couloir, um, you know, which is a local classic that people people love to put on their list every spring. Um, it's really steep, triple black diamond skiing, uh, and requires a skill set that, you know, is beyond what Onyx or, you know, Beacon Guidebooks are going to teach you. You know, you need, uh, need to know how to put crampons on your feet and climb steep, hard snow and ski um, you know, ski, uh, slope angles where you definitely aren't going to stop if you start falling, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's it runs like these are, are what Rocky mountain national park is known for. So, you know, a few days of, of working up into higher elevations towards the divide and getting eyes on and skis on, um, that terrain would be the approach that I would, uh, I would take. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I imagine like same considerations around what we were talking about earlier with w looking at wind, um, you know, the weather stations to understand, uh, you know, temperature, um, as you're mentioning, right, as we get into spring in time and, and things warm up, that becomes really important. So all those, all those factors are still in play. Um, for the, the dragon tail in particular, which is, 
you know, that this striking line. Um, yeah, like let's, how, how would you go about um, like planning a tour in, into that zone um, uh, from Bear Lake? Like what, um, how are you using this tool to, um, to, you know, plan out that route, understand how long it's gonna take, um, what gear you're gonna need. Um, yeah, kind of walk through your process of like, hey, it's the day before and, you're, and you've decided on something like the dragon tail. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna do my best to speak from the mindset of, uh, you know, perspective of someone that's unfamiliar with this terrain, because, you know, it's it's hard for me just to say what I do because it's you know some a place that I've visited, you know, over and over again. But zones like these, you know, are places that I love to visit on my days off, and many of them uh, I've never been to before. So I use resources like this to, you know, to be able to um, to help me you know, uh, on site that terrain, you know, show up and, and do it for the first time. So, you know, uh, once I've, I've determined that, you know, there's a, um, safe enough snowpack and a, in a, uh, good enough weather forecast to, to head up into terrain like this, then, um, I want to start thinking about snow quality, you know, and I want to start thinking about my strategy for, uh, for ascending and descending a route. So, you know, um, snow quality, you know, has a lot to do with elevation and aspect, you know, and um, the dragon tail core is above tree line and it faces southeast. So that means that um, it's exposed to the wind and the sun. And um, if it's springtime, uh, I want to make sure that uh, my timing is right so that I can climb it, you know, on nice frozen, frozen uh, snow. So it's efficient, you know, with, with crampons on my boots. Um, efficient to move up and I ski it when just the top, um, you know, inch or two has melted into a nice carvable corn, uh, corn surface. So, uh, you know, I'm going to think about what the aspect is and, you know, because it faces Southeast and it's above tree line. So it's elevation is going to keep it cool for a little while, but I want to make sure that I'm clicking into my bindings, you know, sometime around mid morning on a line like that, no later, um, you know, you ski something like the dragon tail, you know, at noon or one o'clock in the afternoon, then, um, you know, you've got a one-way wet slide ticket down there to, uh, to Emerald Lake down below, um, because the snow's just gotten too, too wet. So, um, you know, I'll use the, the aspect tool, the slope angle tool, um, to be able to, um, start estimating, um, you know, when and how I'm going to, uh, going to approach a line like that. And, and on top of that was something that's this steep and, and, uh, you know, uh, and serious, I'm, I'm probably going to end up on the phone, you know, um, getting in touch with some people that I know in the area to get some, uh, some good local data about the, the recent conditions to make sure that they jive with what I'm seeing here on the map. Yeah. And to go back to what you said earlier, I love the idea too of, uh, you know, for a big objective like this, that you choose something a little bit more manageable in the same zone where you can get a feel for the snowpack before, before jumping right in, um, uh, along with gathering more beta. That's awesome. Um, cool. In terms of, uh, and so timing is really important. It sounds like you want to click in your bindings, uh, around mid morning. Um, yeah, work backwards from that. How do you, how do you think about, um, how long it's going to take you to get up there, um, travel conditions and, um, how would you kind of plan that route? Yeah. So, you know, we've got in our beacon guidebooks here, we tried to separate the, um, you know, the approach route into the bottoms of, you know, routes like this, um, yeah, as the, uh, as the dotted line there and on the approach route that takes you up to Emerald Lake, which is essentially the, the start of the, you know, the real steep climbing up Dragon Tail, it gives you um, your elevation gain and your horizontal distance. And so you can use those tools to be able to um, roughly calculate, you know, uh, how long it's going to take you to skin up to, you know, uh, with skis on up to the, to the Emerald Lake there. Um, and, you know, generally I think that, you know, I move um, on a, you know, well-packed trail somewhere around two miles per hour for horizontal distance. And, um, depending on how fast I'm, I'm feeling that day, um, add, uh, somewhere between, um, 30 minutes and one hour per 1000 feet of elevation gain vertically. Uh, and this all comes from a, uh, a tool called the Munter formula. And, you know, folks can hop on the, the Googler and, and learn how to, um, how to use that, you know, in relation to uh, horizontal distance and elevation gain. But I think, say, two miles per hour is about our walking distance horizontally, and uh, in one to two thousand feet per hour 
um, per elevation gain is a, is a good place to start. And then you'll dial in on your own, uh, own pace from there. But um, I'll start there. And so I know, you know, how long it's going to take me to get to Emerald Lake, you know, which if we've got you know, roughly rounding it about a mile and a thousand feet of elevation gain, you know, uh, and you're new to the area, maybe it's going to be two hours to get from the Bear Lake parking lot to Emerald Lake, where you're going to strap your skis on your back and then start, uh, start climbing up the couloir. So from then, from there, I can click on the couloir route. And then I know that it's a fairly short horizontal distance, you know, it's only about half a mile, but, um, you know, we're getting up towards 2000 feet, you know, from, uh, from Emerald Lake there. So, you know, for most folks, that's, uh, that's going to be somewhere around two hours to, to boot up that couloir. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And, you know, as we're kind of digging into the tool here, like it's so awesome to be able to just click through these, uh, these, uh, you know, routes that Mike's drawn and, um, kind of get a sense. Um, but what you can also do, um, is, is draw, create your own route. So let's say, for example, you're going somewhere that doesn't have an approach. Um, you can, Kind of use this route building tool and click and it'll uh well it's going to snap to your summer trails there so you can snap to the summer trails or you can go to um just point draw and click away as you uh as you head up here um, and you'll see that the elevation gain and um and profile all gets added as well um so there you get your kind of two miles of horizontal, horizontal distance plus you know, 2,300 feet of elevation gain. Um, cool, and once you've created a route like that, um, you know, you can save it. And I've uh, gone ahead and done, done some pre-work, but um, you can save them into folders and uh, as, a, as a whole tour. Um, so let's say you have your, your waypoint with your, with your wind on it and, and the route, um, and you can add whatever other context, like whether there's, um, you know, steep rollovers you need to navigate or decision points, um, whatever else it is that you're doing and building your tour. Um, and then you can easily share this with, uh, with your partners. Um, so that's kind of another tool that we've, we've got to help with all the stuff that Mike's talking about, about like mapping out the, the time and the distance and, um, and really getting into the details about the tour. Um, cool. Yeah, Mike. I'll, I'll, I'll hop in, Charlie, and just say, you know, for those folks who are, are newer to ski touring out there, you know, it's important to recognize these, these routes are sort of like the currency in which we, uh, which we operate as a ski touring community these days, you know, and, um, you know, I've, I've got countless of these routes drawn in that Charlie just demonstrated here, you know, on my own, uh, on my own app that, um, our tours that I've either tracked myself doing in the past or planned in the past and shared with friends, you know, so um, it's really an art, you know, uh, a modern art, I suppose, to get into, uh, you know, creating these, um, these routes and putting in waypoints and important spots and beta that's really useful so that you can share, um, share with friends who are looking to do the same tours in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. And to give a peek into my own, like what I've got, 150 tracks, 260 lines, nearly a, a 500 waypoints of this this catalog that you build over time, and that's like I love that it's the currency that which you're sharing with friends to uh, to plan. So um, yeah, that's great. Cool. Well, so now we've skied the Dragon Tail Couloir. That's awesome. Um, or rather, maybe we haven't skied it yet. We're about to, we're 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 driving to the trailhead, and we need to uh, we need to um, make sure that we have all these all these details uh, in, deeply inset in our head, and also like uh, in our tool when you're when you're going out there and, and making sure that you're executing your plan um, as you made it uh, the night before. Um, so, if you bear with me for a second, I'm going to jump over to uh, to our mobile phone. which, you know, hopefully works. Well, technical difficulties. Well, maybe we'll stay with the, uh, <laughs> with the web map for now. Um, but if you, uh, oops, we, we lost our, our screen here. Sorry about that. Um, 
So if you imagine that you were um, you were making sure you're, you're checking off your list of things that you need uh, in your pocket as you're, or in your pack as you're, um, as you're heading out for the Dragon Tail Couloir, you want to make sure that all of this work that you did in preparing um, is available on your phone, on your app, uh, offline. Um, and this is, again, true for trail. Or, uh, if, you know, if you're going on a backpacking trip or a trail run or a backcountry ski, um, you can download these offline maps and we'll and basically all of the all of the data and layers and stuff that we were just looking at comes with you offline and you can you can track yourself um, when you're in the backcountry. Um, so again, it's pretty simple that you can choose your choose your resolution and your area, hit save, um, and then that will sync um, right to your phone. This is just telling me that I need to make sure I download it on my phone um, uh, when I when I next open it. So, um, so with that, we've got a full we've got a plan um, and we've got the tool in our in our backpack to uh, to be able to reference that when we go. But I think Mike, you know, uh, be curious to hear your thoughts about like um, about the the phone as a tool navigating in the backcountry and and kind of how this planning process um, uh, you know feeds into that. Yeah, great. Um, you know, so I'd say, uh, for the last, gosh, probably decade, um, you know, my phone has been my, my, my primary tool for navigation in the backcountry. Um, you know, and within that amount of time, um, you know, I knock on wood, uh, you know, never, uh, never dropped the phone off the mountain or, um, never had it run out of batteries when I really couldn't afford to have that happen. Um, but I'm fairly smart and conservative with it in the sense that, um, you know, it's in a waterproof case, it's in my pocket. Uh, I've got a lanyard if, uh, you know, I'm up someplace exposed. Um, and I'm really cautious about battery power. Um, so, you know, down, like as Charlie just mentioned, downloading all of the, um, the data that you need while you're home in Wi-Fi and, and you can do it efficiently is your first move. And then your second is like, when you get to the trailhead, um, you know, turn your phone onto airplane mode um, and stow it someplace secure. Uh, if it's up there in the mountains and it's searching for service where there is none, you're going to juice your battery a whole lot faster. Um, also consider the effect that cold has on your phone for ski season, you know, so um, newer batteries, it's not so much of an issue, but if you've got a phone that's, uh, you know, um, God forbid, more than a year old, um, you know, the, the battery might be juiced a little bit faster. So keeping it tucked inside your puffy jacket on a cold day is a smart move. I also carry a real small stick charger, you know, to be sure that if I'm doing a lot of heavy duty navigation, like say it's whiteout conditions and I've, I've got it out in the cold and the GPS on and tracking um, for a good portion of the day that I've got a backup power source. Um, and usually just one of those little small stick chargers uh, works fine for, you know, one full charge. Yeah, and I'll and I'll add to that too. If you find, um, you'll learn. Uh, you know, I think thinking about your phone as a as a tool in your kit, right, that you have to maintain and 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 understand the limitations of, um, is really important. Um, and one thing I've learned is that I, I like to take a lot of photos and videos when you're out in the backcountry, and that'll drain your battery. Um, a lot, you know, along with the cold temps that we get up here in Montana. Um, so yeah, having either, uh, you know, a warm pocket, sometimes even a hand warmer that you can stick in that pocket with it. Um and a backup battery if you're out for a long time. Uh, super important parts of the kit to make, you know, again, this, this sort of powerful uh, map tool that we've, that we've got, um, you know, reliable for you in the back country. Awesome, well, it's, it's cool to see that, you know, we just focused on one little zone here, but, um, you know, within Rocky Mountain National Park, you know, it's just this expansive, like, lifetime of skiing I imagine and Mike maybe you've been able to spend that lifetime there but I've only ever explored a, a very small part of it so it's um you know in terms of finding new zones I mean one of the questions that we got coming into this was like where else can I go besides Hidden Valley or what are the great spring snow climbs um and just exploring through all of these zones um there's seem to be tons and tons of lines um to check out learn more about and uh and see if they're their uh, adventures that you can put on your list. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head, just like so many other mountain ranges out there. You know, there's a lifetime's worth of exploration. And every time you get on a, on a summit, you're, you're looking off into the next, uh, into the next horizon thinking like, wow, that looks like great skiing over there. You know, so that was sort of my, uh, um, 
you know, my mindset when I wrote this book was, you know, to make sure that, you know, I covered a, a large uh, portion of what the park has to offer, but by no means, you know, tried to, to overwhelm folks with, with too many, too many routes because I skied a lot around here, but there's still plenty more to do. Um, so, you know, if you um, take advantage of, you know, the scope of the, the region here, um, you'll undoubtedly find, you know, um, a, a bunch more places to explore that, that aren't in the book. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Mike, for joining us and sharing some of your knowledge. Um, really cool to see, see how you, how you approach, um, terrain and conditions, um, uh, in, in your home zone. Um, so hope other folks, um, yeah, found that found that as enlightening as I did. Um, I'll throw up this uh, masterclass uh, access forty percent off code one more time, just in case um, you need to grab it. Um, and if you do have any questions for us, there is a Q and A function in Zoom, so please drop some questions in there, um, and and we'll get to them uh, in due time. And again, um, as you just learned, Mike's awesome. So shoot him an email if you. Uh, if you want to get out in the mountains. Yeah, I'm happy to be a, a resource to folks as best I can around uh, around Rocky Mountain National Park. So whether you got questions about, you know, recent conditions or an objective that you're psyched on or, um, yeah, you want to talk about prepping for something in the future, um, draw me a line and, and uh, yeah, happy to help out anytime. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, and I hope you all um, are able to get out in the snow. Um, there's, still, there's still a lot of skiing left to do this year. And uh, yeah, be safe out there. Thanks for joining us.